It's kind of like a speculator that is borrowing short and, and, and buying long. I mean, it, it, it can uh, lead to problematic outcomes. But, right. but um, um, it, it seems that um, people have been trying to assess how, ex, uh, how successful the quantitative easing um, has <coughs> been. And, and it seems that the governments have actually gone uh, in the totally opposite direction. I mean, what the central banks have tried to do is, is to tilt the yield curve, as you suggested. And, and in fact, the, the government could do exactly the same by just issuing more long-term um, uh, bonds. And, and in fact, if you, if you look what they've done, uh, so, uh, sorry, more short term. But what they've done, they they actually did the opposite. So they they kind of, in, in a sense, they've been reversing uh, the actions of the central bank rather than rather than helping helping it to lower the the long term yields. And, and obviously, the governments have done it to reduce the the rollover risk. Um, but uh, but again, this is this there seems to be a conflict between the two policies. They don't, they're not cooperating in in the way that they should. Uh, do you have that sense? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but I always had that sense. I mean, we have this, we have this view that somehow um, we can separate monetary and fiscal policy, and we can put them in little in their distinct institutional boxes, and that life can go on just fine that way. And in normal times, that's true. But we're not in normal times mm. now. We haven't been for th the last three years. We're not going to be for the next 50 years unless there are dramatic fiscal reforms. And, um, and I think we have to recognize that we need to be looking at the whole monetary fiscal framework, mm. um, perhaps from scratch. And then you bring in all the uh, macro prudential and regulatory issues as well. And, um, and you can see that it's a really complicated kind of triad that, that we need to be looking mm. at, I think, with fresh eyes. Okay, I think it's uh, it's time that I give uh, the opportunity to our studio audience uh, to ask any <coughs> questions that they they might have. Um, Harry, so you mentioned that you didn't think now was the time for U.S. fiscal consolidation, and uh, I think you're right. Um, so, what should the U.S. do in the current situation? For example, should there be a, an enhanced kind of job creation program? The recovery is very weak. Eventually, you have to try to deal with the debt situation, but uh, you identified the problem. What specifically do you think the U.S. should do currently? Well, I, I think that the most sensible policy would be um, a pretty big increase in infrastructure spending. Um, and I say that in part because we have a lot of um, underutilized resources. Uh, now is a relatively inexpensive time to be building infrastructure. Um, we desperately need the infrastructure, but we don't want to be doing that um, uh, in isolation. I think that has to be coupled with serious long-term um, reform that grapples with those mile-high pictures that we were looking at. And um, you know, just going out and doing more infrastructure spending not only is not politically viable, um, but it's probably irresponsible if you aren't also dealing with the long-term issues. The, um, and you, you started talking about the, the long-term solutions to this. Um, and we've had previously, we've had uh, Don Brash here, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. We, we were discussing some of the, some of the options. So <coughs> what, how, do we, how do we legislate fiscal rules and, and make sure that uh, our fiscal spending doesn't get out of hand? I mean, what are the, the, the European uh, Union has tried to do that through the uh, Maastricht criteria, but it hasn't been very successful. So how do, you, how do you legislate, how do you constrain future governments from uh, spending too much and how do you make sure that they behave in a responsible manner? Well, this is the perennial question. Um, I, I think the best way to answer it is try to point to some success stories. Um, there are countries that have been successful at implementing these reforms. And they've managed to stick to them even during this crisis. So Sweden comes to mind, um, Chile, um, I think Australia and New Zealand are also models that we could be looking at. Uh, the components are that uh, there is often a surplus target. Uh, there may be a debt target that's coupled with that. Um, in Sweden, they have um, a fiscal policy council, which I think, at least in small countries, that works quite well. Um, the Fiscal Policy Council is uh, independent of the government, and it 
uh, is given a forum, so it testifies actually before Parliament, and um, and it can raise issues, you know, and try to embarrass the government if it wishes, uh, and then the government has to respond. And so, um, at least in small countries, these things seem to be working. Um, so it's more, more of a stick than the carrot. Can you think any about an, any carrot kind of solutions that would make it more <laughs> attractive to uh, politicians to uh, constrain uh, the spending? I mean, it doesn't seem to be much going on. What, what, you mentioned four countries, actually, and, um, and all of them s happen to be inflation targeters. And one of the things that come out, uh, comes out strongly from my research is that, you know, if you fix um, and, and institutionalize the change on the monetary front, it may actually somehow affect the behavior uh, of, of fiscal policy. Let me just show you, this is uh, from uh, one of our research papers. Th these are the um, early adopters of inflation targeting, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Sweden, and UK. And uh, so three, three of the countries that you mentioned, and this is, this is the, debt, the GDP ratio, but it's demeaned. So we took the mean out so that you can see the trends nicely. And, and the shaded area in each case is when inflation <coughs> targeting, meaning a numerical target for inflation was, was legislated. And what you see that with a bit of a maybe two, uh, two years gap, the, there was an improvement not only in monetary policy, but also in fiscal policy. And, and Don Brash was basically saying, and he was the governor, uh, so he's had experience with this, he was saying, yes, when we adopted inflation targeting, it, it, it had a big influence on, on both political parties in thinking about you know, what they can or cannot do, and that's, that's why we see the improvement. Now, the next slide is, is showing the same period for the non-targeters, and what you see, in fact, now we know that the situation has further deteriorated. So what we see is that um, that the fiscal policy has gone in the opposite direction. Now we've got the next slide is actually we've tried to do some fiscal virus, which I know you have a problem with. So I'm not going <laughs> to dwell too much on it. But this is impulse response is basically uh, showing that in 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 the inflation targeting countries. Pre-inflation targeting, which is the green line, uh, 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 a fiscal expansion was accommodated, uh, whereas in the post-inflation uh, targeting region, this is the blue line, fiscal expansion, expansion have actually, the central bank have gone against it. Uh, whereas non-targeters, uh, the next slide, like Switzerland or the US, you actually see the opposite. They, were, they, were, they seem to be accommodating <coughs> now, which is consistent with your estimates of fiscal rules. Of fiscal regimes, whereas in the past they, they were. So, so do you think this might be, you know, if, if uh, direct fiscal reform is, is not very feasible, maybe we can, if the U.S. adopted uh, inflation targeting, maybe that would put more pressure on the, on the politicians because they see now that they're dealing with a, with a Fed that is going to be strongly committed to inflation, so there's no, no way they, they give in, and, and there's more, more chance of promoting regime M as opposed to regime F? Uh, maybe. Um, I think it's a bit of wishful thinking, uh, but there's also a chicken and egg problem here. So uh, Brash may, may say that it was monetary policy that kind of forced fiscal uh, reform. If you talk to uh, um, the governor at the uh, central bank in Sweden, he actually thinks that it was the reverse, that uh, the most important reform was the fiscal reform and the monetary reform was sort of coincident with it. Mm. And, but this is actually putting, again, it's putting, you're putting your finger on a really fundamental problem. And um, this gets a bit technical, but essentially the problem is regime M and regime F are observationally equivalent. And what that means is you can generate the same data from regime M as you can from regime F. Now that makes, that poses a challenge for economists to try to find what kinds of um, economic restrictions can tell you which regime you're in. And nobody solved that problem yet. And so, well, I, I mean, I have, I, I've done a lot of VAR work my, myself, and I, I recognize that, I mean, I think these are very interesting patterns of correlation that are out there. But it's, it's, all, it's quite difficult to in, infer uh, what is causal here. Mm. And, and so, I guess the last thing I'd say about this is Europe is a great counterexample because EMU was an experiment where they said, okay, look, we recognize that a monetary union without a fiscal union is a problem. 
but what the heck, let's do the monetary union and that'll force the fiscal authorities to conform. Mm. Well, what have we seen? Mm. So, well, I think the explanation <laughs> is, and it's also something that I'm trying to model in one paper, is, is this free riding problem. If you have an individual country and the, and the central bank's fighting against uh, the government, then and, and raises rates, it really punishes the, the government in a major way. If you're in a small country, a part of the union like Greece, you know, all your fiscal expansion, you, you're getting all the benefits because you're buying the votes, but the, 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 Euro, the common central bank is not going to punish right. you because they care about the union as a whole. So there's this free riding moral hazard type of problem, in, especially with small countries. But, but I agree with you. I mean, based on, at face value, this would say, well, the ECB should have perfect fiscal outcomes, which is obviously not, not Well, and reality. also I think in Europe you can even argue that what's happening now is it's a race to the bottom, that... Um, that the ECB has become the central bank of Greece <laughs> and we're sort of relying on Germany to be the fiscal authority for Greece mm. and um, you know it's not clear that 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 is sustainable mm. uh, and I think if you talk to some German economists they'll make exactly that argument um, and so the political economy I think could cut the other way also Okay, I think we have time maybe uh, for one last question, if there is one. Uh, okay. How, how do you deal with the sort of political constraint that there's this party in the United States called the Republicans? Hmm. Is there? The, <laughs> well, the, the, Republic, the, Republicans, uh, the Republicans in the United States uh, uh, want, want some kind of fiscal consolidation. Time in the U.S.'s recovery is uh, uh, very weak. They don't want to raise any uh, taxes. Um, and they're, they're strong. <coughs> In the United States, their political position is quite strong. Um, I mean, they also don't believe in dealing with climate change and lots of other things. How do you how do you address this? How do you how do you get people to think rationally about, in this case, an economic issue? Golly, that's mm -hmm. that's not an economic question. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you would end with something that sounded more economic, like how do you model that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that. It could be that markets will end up um, informing the Republicans and the Democrats that if they can't get their act together, um, the U.S. economy is going to really suffer. You know, I mean, a lot of Republicans have very blithely said that, oh, this debt ceiling thing, you know, it's no big deal. Well, we'll see if it's no big deal. If they can't find a resolution to this, um, we'll see how markets react. Um, maybe the world really is Ricardian and people believe in their heart of hearts that eventually there will be dramatic entitlements reform, we won't need to raise taxes, and um, that'll be the resolution. Maybe that's what people believe. So I think the, the really hard problem here is everything that's going on hinges on what people's expectations of future policies are, but we don't observe those expectations. So I can always tell you a story that's consistent with any equilibrium that we're observing by just varying those expectations, which if they're free parameters, <laughs> I'm free to do. Um, and so Republicans are varying those expectations in whatever manner is sort of politically expedient. And I think the Democrats are too. Um, so I, I don't think this is a, a partisan point. I think neither party has really uh, been terribly responsible here. Okay, well I think we uh, we don't have uh, one more question. Do you have yeah. anything? Uh, so we might have to finish uh, here I think, but uh, before we do uh, we have a little thank you present Eric, um, and we've already done that in, with our previous uh, speaker. Uh, we've got some Australian football rules uh, tickets uh, for you and your son uh, on the weekend, uh, so um, Thank you very much for your contribution. Please join me in thanking Eric for, for his interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.